In this episode of Electronics Essentials, we'll be looking at components, including capacitors, relays, transistors, and a review of our old friend's resistors and diodes. Plus, we'll be introducing a new type of diode. Hey gang, Dan from Creepy Creations here, and I just uh, wanted to let you know that some of the things that we are doing in this video are actually quite dangerous. So please, if you don't know what you're doing, don't try any of these things at home, okay? Hey Justin, what you doing? I thought I'd try to build another one of your sensor saver circuits, but even with the schematic diagram and all these nifty parts, I can't make heads or tails of it. Hey, no problem. Why don't we walk through each component individually? That way, you'll understand how each one works, and that should help you better identify how the circuit works. Well, that would be great! If I knew what all these crazy looking things did and how they worked, that would help a lot. Like, what are these things? Those are capacitors. Really? They look so different from one another. How could they both be capacitors? Capacitors come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but they all have one thing in common. They can be used to store an electrical charge. Unlike a battery, which stores electricity chemically, a capacitor actually holds the electrical charge itself. So it holds an electrical charge? Well, how big of a charge can it hold? That depends on the size of the capacitor and its voltage rating. Some capacitors are very small and hardly hold any charge at all. And some large ones can hold a really big charge. That's why you have to be careful when handling capacitors. You might pick one up that still has a charge. Well, yikes! How do you tell if one has a charge or not? Well, there's two ways. The easy way, and the hard way. Dare I ask what the hard way is? Sure, you just grab the two leads like this. <laughs> wow, that's no fun. Okay, maybe I'll try the easy way instead. What would that be? Simple. You short out the leads of the capacitor with something like a screwdriver. You just make sure that the handle is insulated. Here, I set one up on the uh, demo bench. Wow! That was a pretty big spark! Let's look at that again in slow motion. No special effects here, folks. Look at that spark! And that's just from a 9-volt battery. A 9-volt battery did that? Wow! Yeah, some capacitors are rated up to even hundreds or even thousands of volts. That's why you have to be so careful. Well, I'll definitely be careful then. These capacitors look like tricky little things. They must be more complicated than they look. You'd think so, wouldn't you? The insides of a capacitor are actually pretty simple. The leads are connected inside to two metal plates. The size of the plates, the space between them, and how well they're insulated determines how much of a charge the capacitor can hold. Since air isn't the best insulator, during manufacturing, a material called a dielectric is inserted between the two plates. This allows the capacitor to hold an even larger charge. But sometimes the dielectric isn't enough, so instead we'll use a large quantity of a compound called an electrolyte, with a thin layer of dielectric on top. This allows us to manufacture capacitors with huge values. The only downside to an electrolytic capacitor is the fact that because we have two different materials, now the capacitor has a positive and a negative end, so we must be very careful how we wire it up. And since a capacitor is a couple of plates, the symbol for it is a couple of parallel lines. Sometimes one of them is curved. Oh yeah, and if it's polarized or electrolytic, it'll have a little plus sign on one end. Oh hey, I've seen those symbols on a circuit diagram before. I never used to know what they mean, but now I know. I didn't know the positive and negative ends were that important, though. Important? Heck, it can be downright dangerous. If you hook it up wrong, well, you could be screwed. It could blow up in your face. Hey, it might be so awesome. Blow up? Come on, you're just saying that. Oh, don't believe me, huh? Well, I got a little demo that might just convince you otherwise. Thank <laughs> you. 
seriously hurt. What's the saying? You can take your eye out of that thing? <laughs> Duly noted. Okay, so a capacitor holds a charge. Well, how long does it take to charge up? Well, when I showed you how the screwdriver discharged the capacitor, all I did was quickly touch a 9-volt battery to it. It charged up almost instantly. Really? Why so fast? There was nothing to limit the current, so it charged up instantly. So, if we somehow limit the currents, would that mean the capacitor takes longer to charge? Indeed it would. Why? Got an idea? Well, I remember when we were hooking up LEDs, we used a resistor to limit the current going through them. Could we use the same thing here? Absolutely! If we hook up a resistor in front of the capacitor, the capacitor will take longer to charge. And if I remember correctly, the bigger the resistor, the lower the current. So that would make the capacitor take longer to charge, right? Good memory! That's right! You've got something in mind. I can hear the gears grinding. Really, Dad? Sorry, couldn't resist. Well, I was just thinking, if there's some way of knowing when the capacitor is charged, then you can measure how long it took. And that would give you... A timer! A timer circuit! Exactly! In fact, most timer circuits use a combination of a resistor and capacitor to act as a timer. So, those resistors are handy for more than just LEDs. All you have to do is measure the voltage on the capacitor, and at some point it will become charged to the supply voltage of your circuit. Hmm, but sitting around with a voltmeter attached to your circuit all day doesn't seem very practical. Is there a way to measure the voltage inside the circuit? Of course there is. We can use one of these. Um, isn't that a diode? Well, yes, but I mean... Well, my memory's not that bad. If I recall, a diode only lets current flow through in one direction and completely stops it the other way. So how is that going to measure a voltage? Well, you're right. A regular diode like this would actually be useless. But what if we had a diode that would block the voltage until it reached a certain level and then let it through? What? What kind of diode does that? There's no such thing. Actually, yes there is. It's called a Zener diode. Oh, right, and only available on the planet Zener, I suppose. Actually, they're available right here on planet Earth. They sound strange, but they're actually pretty cool. They're used in all sorts of things. Just so happens that a Zener diode is perfect for what we want to do. If you recall, this is what a diode looks like. A Zener diode looks almost the same, except that the little bar across the top has two bends in the ends. If you look at it, it kind of looks like a misshapen Z, so it's easy to remember the difference. Like a regular diode, a Zener diode will conduct electricity in one direction. But if we reverse it, it blocks it. However, if we increase the voltage, we'll reach a point where the Zener diode finally gives up and says, oh, okay, I'll let you through after all. Whereas a regular diode will continue to block the voltage. That's the big difference. Oh, cool! So if you pick a Zener diode with a voltage lower than the supply voltage, you'll always get it to conduct at some point, based on the timing of the circuit made with the resistor and the capacitor. You've got it! At some point in the timing cycle, the Zener diode will conduct, but we can use that as the basis of our timing circuit. Oh, that's great! So we could use that voltage to light some LEDs or start a motor or... Yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. Unfortunately, it's never that simple. Why does that not surprise me? The amount of current some LEDs use, or even a motor, is way more than we'd get out of the Zener diode. Don't forget, we limited the current going in, so there's not much current available to come out. Oh, great, it's useless then. Unless you had some way of amplifying the current, that timer doesn't do anything for us. So we'll amplify it then. Well, let me guess, there's some little gizmo that does that. You bet, it's called a transistor. Well, that's pretty small. Are you sure that's an amplifier? Absolutely. A transistor can be used as a simple amplifier. Its only purpose in life is to take a tiny amount of current and amplify it into a large amount of current. 
Oh, so if we use a transistor to amplify the current going through the zener diode, then we can do something useful with it. You got it. You catch it up pretty quick. You just have to make sure you use the right kind of transistor. There are two basic kinds, NPN and PNP. Yeah, the P stands for negative and positive. They transfer current in the opposite direction, which is why there are two types. We'll use the NPN type of transistor for this circuit. Okay, but how does that tiny little thing amplify current? Looking inside a typical NPN transistor, we see that there are three contacts or wires. One is the base, one is the emitter, and one is the collector. The middle contact or base is connected internally to a small piece of silicon which has been chemically altered through a process called doping to now represent a P style of silicon. The emitter is connected to a small piece of silicon which has been doped to represent an N style of silicon. The collector is also attached to a piece of silicon, which has been doped to represent an N style of silicon. This gives us our traditional NPN transistor configuration. A transistor could also be thought of as a switch. In this case, current wants to flow from the collector through and out the emitter, except that it's blocked by the opposite material in the center. However, if we apply a very small amount of current to the base, now the current is allowed to flow through from the collector through to the emitter sort of like a relay. However, in a transistor's case, we can vary the amount of current applied at the base, and this will vary the amount of current flowing through the transistor, so it actually could act as an amplifier. The schematic diagram for a transistor is a little more complicated because we have three leads. The base always comes in the middle on the flat surface. The collector comes in with nothing else other than the lead, and the emitter has the arrow on it. For an NPN transistor, the arrow always points outward. For a PNP style transistor, the arrow points inward so you can tell the difference. Oh, so now we can have more current to play with. Right, in fact, if we were only just turning on some LEDs, we'd be done. I sense a butt coming. Remember, the sensor saver was originally designed to switch just about anything. So in order to do that, we'll have to use something a little more heavy duty to switch the power. Well, hey, couldn't we use a relay? We use those in our projects all the time, and they can handle a lot of current. Hey, great idea! Do you remember how relays work? Why do I get the feeling I'm gonna get a refresher anyways? Relays come in all sorts of shapes and sizes too, but they mostly look like large lumpy rectangular blocks. If you strip away the outer casing, a relay is just an electrically operated switch. The relay is operated by this, a coil of wire wound around an iron core. This is an electromagnet, and when activated, it becomes magnetized and pulls the contact arm down towards it. The switch part of the relay is here. It consists of a contact arm, which is the common part of one side of the switch, and then one or more sets of contacts. In this case, we have two, a normally open and normally closed set of contacts, so that the relay can either be used to switch something on or switch something off. To operate the relay, we simply apply a current to the electromagnet, and the contact arm is pulled down. When current is removed from the electromagnet, a spring pulls the contact arm back up. Needless to say, the schematic diagram for a relay should be easily recognizable, with the relay coil, contact arm, and contacts clearly defined. Now, here's a little gotcha with relays. They're really cool, except because they work on a magnetic field, they have some inherent problems. When you apply current, a magnetic field is quickly set up around the coil. But when you take the current away, that collapses, and guess what? It induces a current back into the coil, sort of like a generator. Depending on the size of the coil and the voltages involved, one of two things is going to happen. Either that collapsing field is going to induce a current so large that it actually arcs across the contacts of the relay coil, or it's going to induce a huge voltage spike into the circuit, unless you give it someplace else to go. That's why in almost any relay circuit, you'll see a diode inserted. That's the path that gives that spike someplace else to go. Now, when that field builds up and collapses, the voltage it generates can actually just circulate through the diode, and it's dissipated harmlessly. Oh, now I remember how they work. And I always remember seeing a diode in there before. I always wondered what it was for. Well, now you know. We can use the transistor to hook up to the relay coil, and that can fire the relay. Wow, I think that's a whole circuit. 
Pretty much, but the only thing we might want to add is a smaller capacitor in front of the transistor just to absorb any surges that come through when the Zener diode triggers. And if we make the resistor a variable one, then we can set the timer for how long we like. Hey, great idea! It'll make it a lot more flexible. <laughs> so let's see how this whole circuit looks now that we've walked through each component. Here's the completed sensor saver circuit diagram. On the side you can see the variable resistor. We've added two other resistors at the top and the bottom to add an upper and lower limit to the timing range. Here's the capacitor. And here's the Zener diode that will trigger when the voltage at the capacitor reaches a certain level. In this case, 5.6 volts. Here's the transistor that gets triggered when the Zener diode finally starts conducting. And we've added a small capacitor here just to absorb any spikes that the Zener diode might produce. When the transistor fires, of course, it triggers the relay with its diode to help protect the rest of the circuit. And that's it! Well, oh, that's awesome! I think I'm going to make another one of those. But it will work, won't it? Of course! Here's one built exactly like the diagram. It's in our hot controller. The only difference is, I put a couple of LEDs on. One to show when the power's on, and the other one to show when the circuit's actually firing. Just as a visual cue. So one light comes on as soon as I apply the power. Now the circuit is slowly charging, and the other light comes on, and the circuit actually fires. Well, that's awesome! Well, I'm going to get to work building another one. There's a lot of parts in here, so hopefully I remember what they all do. Phew, that was a lot to cover. Got it all memorized? Nah, didn't think so. But to help you remember, here's a little segment we like to call Recap Time. Recap Time! Let's review what we learned today. If you hook it up wrong, you're screwed and it'll blow up in your face. Remember, a capacitor's job is to hold a charge. But by inserting a resistor into the circuit, we limit the current and the capacitor takes longer to charge. The bigger the value of the resistor, the longer the capacitor takes to charge. This is the basis of a classic RC or resistor capacitor timing circuit. And when we're building larger timing values, we may end up using an electrolytic capacitor, which is polarized. Don't forget to wire it up in the proper direction or you could have a nasty surprise. A regular diode will only pass current in one direction. A Zener diode, however, will also pass current in the other direction, but only once you've reached the Zener voltage. Transistors can best be thought of as current amplifiers. By presenting a very small current at the base, we can control a very large current between the collector and the emitter. There are two basic types, NPN and PNP, and each one allows current to flow in the opposite direction of the other. The easiest way to tell is look at the arrow on the emitter. That'll tell you which way the current is allowed to flow. Relays are basically electrically operated switches. When you pass a current through the coil, it closes the set of contacts. When you release the current, the contacts open again. Because the contacts and the coil are usually isolated from one another, this makes it possible to switch high voltages such as line current in your house using a smaller, lower voltage circuit. Just remember that the relay has to have contacts rated for the voltage and current that you're trying to switch. And don't forget, put that diode in place or the collapsing magnetic field will induce a spike and it could fry the rest of your circuit. 